Hi everyone, welcome to this session on data analysis on data synthesis for your meta-analysis. We will discuss how you will go about putting all the data that you have extracted together and the sorts of decisions that you make along the way. So before the synthesis, you have to extract the relevant pieces of data from the individual papers. And you do this into an extraction sheet, which can range from something like an onboard Excel sheet to fancy meta-analysis software. For each study, you collect the relevant data elements. This is where your protocol comes in because your protocol tells you what you plan to do and what data elements you plan to collect. You don't want to collect some data elements, leave some out, and then have to come back for subsequent rounds of data extraction. In a perfect world, you would, the papers will present all the data that you need exactly the way you want them but that doesn't always happen. So sometimes you have to calculate the estimates that you need. This table shows you how you can go from one statistical estimate to another. So for instance, if you wanted to include the standard error of an estimate in your data, but the authors did not present this, you can get the standard error from save the 95% confidence interval, by subtracting the lower limit from the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval and then dividing that by 3.92. Similarly, you can derive your standard error from the studies effect estimate, or you can derive your standard error from the standard deviation. So the bottom line is, sometimes you don't get the exact piece of data that you want, and you have to do some of that estimation or that calculation yourself. If you still can't find the estimate that will help you from the paper, you can reach out to the authors, ask them for help, ask them for pieces of data or pieces of result that maybe they didn't publish, but they have. Just make sure that you're not asking the authors to run new analysis for you because nobody's going to do that. If all else fails, you cannot calculate the estimate, you've reached out to the authors, they can help you or maybe they don't respond then go ahead and document what is missing and how you address that. And that should go in the method section of your meta-analysis. So today, like I said earlier, we're discussing data synthesis. This slide just shows you where data synthesis falls within the nine-step procedure for conducting a meta-analysis, which I am sure you're familiar with by now. Just to say that don't be tempted to jump straight to the synthesis, the earlier steps, the first six steps, they are extremely important and they will help you. So now we've talked about what you do before you get to data synthesis. You've extracted your data, you're ready for data synthesis or data analysis. What happens at this step? What are the steps involved in, in analyzing the data? The first thing that you do is you create a pooled estimate or the average effect size from all the studies. And you're going to be making decisions here. Decisions like what kind of model should I use to pull the estimate? Is it fixed effect or random effect? You can, you'll be making decisions like um, if it's a continuous, uh, if your effect estimate is a continuous variable, should I use mean difference or standardized mean difference? And you have to have reasons why you're making one decision or another. Another thing, in later sessions, you will learn about exploring publication bias, influence analysis, how to assess heterogeneity. The bottom line is your work is not done once you're done creating the pooled estimate. That's what I just wanted to communicate with this slide. So now that you know what is involved in the analysis, Let's drive straight. Let's dive straight into creating the pooled estimates. So let's talk about the pooled estimate. That's the main reason most people carry out a meta-analysis in the first place, right? So at the most basic level, a meta-analysis averages the effects across all the included studies. So let's say you have 10 studies. And it does this by creating a weighted average of all the point estimates. So could be the mean, the mean difference, the odds ratio, whatever, and their confidence intervals. The weighted average of the estimate is given by the formula here. The numerator is the sum of the product of the estimate 
point estimate from each study and the weight assigned to that study, while the denominator is the sum of all the weights of the weight of all the um, primary studies included in the meta-analysis. Now, you need to make a decision about the weights that you're assigning to the study. And there are two common approaches, the fixed effect and the random effects. The one you choose will depend on the way, on your understanding of the way that the studies measure exposure and outcome amongst other things. So here, like I said earlier, your pooled estimate is basically an average of all the point estimates and their confidence interval. You can use a fixed effect model or a random effects model. How do you choose? The fixed effect model or the fixed effect meta-analysis assumes that there's one true effect size across all the primary studies. So it's basically assuming that each of the studies that are included in our meta-analysis, they're measuring or estimating the same underlying parameter. So we're assuming that all the studies were conducted in the same population. They use the same inclusion criteria. The treatments or the interventions were administered in the same way and that the outcomes have been measured consistently. Because of this, we think, or the fixed effect analysis assumes that there's only one source of error. And that is the within study error, because you can see here, if you look at the A schema, you can see here for study one, two, three, four, that were included in this um, sample meta-analysis, you can see this is a point estimate and this is a 95% confidence interval. So the fixed effects meta-analysis just assumes that the only source of variation in this studies is purely due to the random sampling error. So within study variation. The random effects meta-analysis on the other end assumes that each study, so each of these four studies in this schema is estimating a study specific true effect. And that that true effect can vary from study to study due to heterogeneity. So for instance, say some of the participants in one study are slightly older than the participants in another study, or maybe differences in the socioeconomic status of the participants of a study. The random effects meta-analysis assumes that there will be differences, that the differences vary, the studies vary. And so what we are estimating is both the mean and the variance of these true effect sizes across the population of potential studies. So where the fixed, the random effects analysis assumes that there are two sources of error or variance in the studies. The within study variance, which is the 95% confidence interval or the variation around the effect, the study effect size, and also the between study variance. So the random effects meta-analysis thinks about studies differ one, the studies differ one from another. So there's variation at that level. And then within the study itself, there's variation or variance around the um, effect mean effect size. So this slide just puts the fixed and random effects um, the model side by side. Like I said, both of them, both of the fixed effect meta-analysis and the random effect meta-analysis, they produce weighted averages. The weights are assigned to the individual studies based on the inverse of the inverse of the overall error variance. The fixed effect meta-analysis assumes only one source of error, the within study variance. And because of that, it takes it takes um, it takes cognizance, it uses a standard error of each study as the weight or the inverse of the standard error. So you can see here, this is the same formula for weighted average that you saw in the earlier slide, but now we're replacing WI, that is the weight of steady I in the meta-analysis, we're replacing it with the inverse of a standard error of steady I. And here the numerator where we, we have the point estimate of steady I and the weight of steady I, we now have beta one, which is the point estimate of steady I, divided by the um, square of a standard error. So this is the inverse of a 
standard error. And you can see here, just read the bottom of the slide, you can see that beta i is the point estimate from each study. So the point as estimate for um, study i, SEI is a standard um, error of the point estimate from study i. So the fixed effects, just fixed effects meta-analysis just looks at the standard, incorporates the standard error the within study variance. Now, the random effects meta-analysis on the other hand, thinks uses both the within study variance, same thing, which is a standard error, and the between study variance, which is called, which is represented by tau squared. So the difference between the fixed effect and the random effects meta-analysis is that the fixed effect just looks at the within steady variance represented by the inverse of the standard error, while the random effects looks at both the within steady variance and the between steady variance represented by tau squared. Now, you've heard me talk about inverse, um, the inverse variance method. Basically, the weight is assigned using the inverse of the standard error. So for the fixed effect meta-analysis, for instance, studies with smaller standard errors, usually larger studies, get more weight because it's, they, they, they are assumed to be more reliable. The smaller the 95% confidence interval, the higher the reliability of the um, estimate typically. So studies with the smaller standard errors tend to, uh, they are assigned a higher weight in the fixed effects um, meta-analysis. The random effects meta-analysis also still assigns studies with smaller standard error. It gives them a higher weight, but proportionally in the random effects meta-analysis, studies with um, the smaller studies with slightly bigger standard errors get a higher weight in random effects meta-analysis compared to fixed effects meta-analysis. So basically the thing to take away from this slide is that both fixed effects and random effects meta-analysis use the weighted average and the average, the weight of assigned to each study is derived using an inverse variance method. For fixed effect, it looks at only the within study variance. So it uses only the inverse of the square of the standard error, while the random effect uses both within study variance uh, calculated by the standard error, as well as the between study variance calculated, um, represented by the tau squared. Now this tau squared, there are different ways that you can derive this tau squared, but the most common one is the method derived by, described by Desimonian and Laird. You'll learn about that a little later. So, moving on, in thinking about the model that you use, just let us remember the measurement theory that our estimate is always a sum of the true value and an error term. And there are potential sources of error in the primary studies that we need to think about when we make a decision on the model to use. Because sometimes when you're reading a primary, when you're reading a, uh, um, a peer reviewed article, everything just looks like, oh, it's so well done. There cannot be error sources. And you know, let's just go ahead. This is such a great study. After all, it's already peer reviewed and published. But we have to think about carefully the fact that every estimate that is reported there's an error around it. And so what kinds of errors or what kind what what kinds of errors should you have in mind? Here, when you think about the true causal effect, is an example, instruments and scales. So you have to think about what we believe about the true causal effect in primary studies depends on what we are measuring and how we're measuring them. Some concepts are defined similarly, but they're measured using different scales and instruments. And that can be a reasonable source of variation. So if you look at this slide, for instance, on the left, you will see a receiver operator characteristic. Oops, sorry. Here on the left, you will see a receiver character operator characteristic curve or ROC curve that's comparing the sensitivity and false pulse sensitivity and false positive rate of three instruments that are measuring the same construct, the construct of depression. 
So you have the um, CESD score, that is the Center for Epidemiologic Study Depression Score. You have the 16, it's originally a 20 item um, instrument, and there's a 16 item CESD score. And then there's the PHQ-9 score, which is the patient health questionnaire score. You can, these three instruments, they assess, they're used to assess patients for depression. And you can see that the instruments, they perform differently at different thresholds. So if at the sensitivity of 20%, you can see how that the CESD score performs slightly worse than the 16 item C is the score and the PHQ-9. So bottom line is that even though they're measuring the same thing, the same underlying construct of depression, they perform differently at different sensitivity thresholds. The second one on the right, the second picture on the right is a Venn diagram that's showing the overlap between patients diagnosed with, with depression by two scales measuring the same outcome. So this, on, on here, the blue one is the PHQ-9, and then the yellow one is a CESD-10, and CESD-9 and 21. And here, although they produce similar estimates of depression, so you can see the PHQ-9 says 7.9% and the CESD says 8.1%. There are some patients that are diagnosed as depressed by the PHQ-9 that are missed by the CESD-9. CSD. So this has implications for our data synthesis models. Can we say for sure that these two instruments are estimating the same causal effect? If we have studies, primary studies, that use both scales in our meta-analysis. And this is just an example. It's just, just prompting you to think about, even though the construct that you're measuring may be, may be the same, using different scales, so using different instruments may actually mean that you're measuring slightly different things. And it might not be safe to assume that a fixed effect model is the best model. Here is another point to consider. Even with instruments and scales, even when the primary studies use the same instrument, cutoffs, cutoff points can be a source of between study variability. If you look at this table, I'm just going to give you one minute to look at the table for less than one minute. So in the example presented here, all the studies use the PHQ-9 scale, but they use different cutoff points. So if you look at this, if you look at this first column, you can see the cutoff score that ranges from seven to 15. to diagnose depression. If you look at this column, the sensitivity, the probability, the sensitivity of, uh, of an instrument is the probability that an actual positive instance is classified as positive. And you can see that the sensitivity varies widely from 0 0.62 to 0 0.89. So when the cutoff was 15, when the cutoff score was 15, the sensitivity was 0 0.62. And then when the cutoff point was 11, the sensitivity was 0 0.89. And there's a variation between that. And if you look at the two of them, the um, if you if you, you can also look at the study, they used a cutoff point of seven, and the study they used a cutoff point of nine. Their sensitivity is the same, and their 95% confidence intervals are pretty close. So what it suggests is that even though the studies all use the same scale, the cutoff points that they used actually will mean that they are diagnosing different types or different numbers of patients as having depression and as not having depression. And this can call into question the assumption that the outcomes that these different studies are measuring is exactly the same. So it's not just about using different instrument and scales to measure the same construct. Even when authors or different studies have used the same scale to measure the same construct, you also have to think about cutoff points and whether we're measuring, ex whether all the primary studies are saying exactly the same thing. So what is a summary? Fixed effect versus random effects model is a decision you make. 
and you make this decision based on your intentions and what you know or believe about the primary studies. I'm just going to quickly talk about intentions. You want to ask yourself, are we planning to generalize the findings of this meta-analysis beyond the, few, the, the primary um, studies? If yes, you should consider a random effects model. And I won't dwell on this too much because in public health, especially in the global health setting, we're usually trying to take evidence from existing studies and generalize to a whole population or to another population elsewhere. So if we're trying to generalize the, um, our findings beyond the studies, beyond the primary studies in our meta-analysis, we should be thinking about a random effects model. And then the other thing is, what do you believe about the effect size? If you believe that there's one true effect across all your primary studies, and whatever differences you see in the studies are due to sample size or you know, precision, then you should consider a fixed effects meta-analysis. Although, as we've discussed in the last two or three slides, this is a very high bar to scale because it assumes that all the primary studies are methodologically similar. So this is the message. If you're not sure whether you should use a fixed effect or random effects meta-analysis, just do random effects meta-analysis. I have recommended that, you know, you should lean towards or be biased towards um, random effects meta-analysis, but it's not perfect either. And you need to keep this in mind as we conduct the analysis. So what are some of the things we have to think about? Even though random effects meta-analysis thinks about and considers between study variation, it still assumes that the between study variation is random. And so we're still assuming that we are estimating a common effect, which may not always be correct. And whenever we do a random effects meta-analysis, we need to assess uh, we need to assess the sources of those heterogeneity. It's not enough to say, oh, I've, we, here are the reasons why we've decided to go with random effects meta-analysis and then just go on like that. We have to talk about how we looked at the sources of the heterogeneity, and that's going to come up in future sessions. And then the random effects um, meta-analysis gives a lot more weight to smaller studies. And it does not account for errors in our estimate of tau squared. Remember tau squared is the between, um, between study variation. Sometimes when the confidence intervals are too narrow or the p-values are too small, it gives, um, it, it, it gives them like more weight than is necessary. And when there's a small number of studies, maybe you've done your literature review and you only came up with say five primary studies and all of that, random effects meta-analysis or the estimate, tau squared estimate is not very stable. As a matter of fact, some schools of thought suggest that if you have a small number of primary studies, you should consider a fixed effects meta-analysis. However, there are methods that exist, such as, such as the atong nap method or the Bayesian approaches that you can actually use to address some of the challenges with random effects meta-analysis. So this slide is basically saying, even though we see error on the side of random effects meta-analysis, it is not without its own challenges. So now moving on. You've extracted the data, you've, um, you've made a decision about what model you're going to use. You've actually run the um, data synthesis or the, the data analysis and you, how are you going to present your results or how are you going to interpret it? And that brings us to forest plots. So here on the left side of the screen, is an example of a forest plot. And if you are a if you're a Harry Potter fan, you can easily, you can, you can quickly see where this is coming from, right? So this is what a forest plot looks like. And it is a visual summary of your analysis and the findings of your meta-analysis. What it does is that it gives you, it shows you everything at a glance. The effect size estimates and the confidence intervals for each of your primary study the overall effect size of all the studies and the confidence interval. You can also see you know, visually the extent to which the results 
from the individual studies differ. So now let's run through how you will read a forest plot, plot systematically, and we're going to use the numbered guide on the slide. So number one is here you can see on the left, the first thing you see is the study IDs. And so it tells you the name of the author and the year. So author and year. And sometimes if there's like more than one author, or rather if there's more than one study from an author in a year, you can see it will be labeled A, B. So you can have the study IDs and the um, year that they were published. That's like this, what you used to identify the study. And then you can see here the number of people in the study. So here we have the intervention group and the control group. The small n is the number, is the outcome of the people in the intervention group or the people in the intervention group that have the outcome of interest. And then the big N is the total number of people in the intervention group. Same here for the control group. So say for instance, I don't know, the outcome is the number of people who, who had anemia at the end of an intervention. So in the intervention group, let's say one out of the 131 people had that outcome, say anemia. And in the control group, it was two out of the 133 people. So this is how you will read this, right? And then you can also see here, sorry, I'm going to wear my glasses. You can also see here the point estimate and the 95% confidence interval for each of those primary studies. So you can see here is assessing the relative, uh, relative risk. And you can see the relative risk here. You can see you can see for each study, you can see the point estimate, the 95% confidence interval around the, the point estimate and the 95% confidence interval. What you have here, this solid line is the line of no effect. So this is the location of the results relative to the line that tells you whether this intervention had an effect or no effect. So you can see here the, the relative risk of one and you can see to the left of it is the negative and to the right of it is the positive. The x-axis is usually labeled automatically by the software that you're using, but it basically tells you the range of the effect estimates. And you can see for the individual primary studies, you have the box and the line around it. The boxes show you the effect estimates from the single studies, and the size of the boxes show you the relative weight. And so you can see now for these three primary studies that ALBOS 2003 has the biggest box. And so it has the biggest, the highest weight, is assigned the highest weight for this meta-analysis. The last thing you see here is the diamond. The diamond shows you the pooled results. So for instance, this is the, point estimate of the pulled result, the center of the diamond is the point estimate of the pulled result. And the wings, if you like, or the width of the diamond is your 95% confidence interval around the pulled estimate. So, okay. So this is what you, you see with a forest plot. But so going over it again, you can see the individual studies. You can see their effect estimates, their point of point estimates and the 95% confidence interval around them. You can see the sizes of the boxes that shows you the weights assigned to each study. You can see the diamond that shows you the overall, the pulled result. The center of the diamond is the point estimate for your pulled uh, result for your meta-analysis and the width of the wings is the 95% confidence interval, interval. Here you can see some other statistics that the, um, that the software has produced. So test for heterogeneity. You can see here the I squared. I squared, you learn about it in later sessions. So the I squared is 0%. Basically says there's no heterogeneity the studies are pretty similar. And because it's zero, the heterogeneity is zero, we use the fixed effect model. That means the between study variation is not there. The P um, value here just tells you 
the overall, the level of statistical significance. So the test for heterogeneity, of course, is not significant because the heterogeneity is 0%. And then test for overall effect, the Z score is 0.35 and the P is 0.7. And you can actually see, I'm not surprised, or you shouldn't be surprised that it's not significant because you can see that the width or the wings of Z um, diamond crosses the line of no effect. So the 95% the confidence interval for this relative risk contains one. And so it's not significant. So basically, this is how you will present your meta-analysis or when you read a paper that includes a meta-analysis, you would always see this, um, this forest plot. So now that we've talked about how you do your data synthesis, how you make the decisions, how you present, your um how you present your results in a forest plot and how you or other people will interpret it. Let's go ahead and talk about um different types of estimates or effect measures that you can use. So we've we've considered what the pool estimate is, your approach to deriving it, how to visually represent it. We will now go ahead and consider specific examples, and we will start with ratio or multiplicative effect measures. Um, so I'm assuming that everybody knows the definitions of relative um, relative risk, hazard ratios, and odds ratio. I will not go over that, but just remember that for relative risk and odds ratio, one, if, if they're one, that means there's no effect. So the first example that I am going to show you is this example of the um, effect of living in irrigated areas and the risk of intestinal schistosomiasis. This basically, so it shows you, you can see there are 10 primary studies, Tanzania 1966, all the way down to Cote d'Ivoire 2005. And um, you can see the Cote d'Ivoire 2005 that is used twice in this um, meta-analysis suggests that there are two different arms that you can, you extracted data from. And then for each study, notice also the line of no effect, which is a solid line. And because it is a relative, it is risk ratio, the line of no effect is at one. So basically anything to the left of the solid line is like, there was no if there was no um, association between living in an irrigated area and the risk of inter intestinal schistosomiasis, and anything to the right of the solid line shows that there was a positive association. Right. So for each study, notice the effect size. Notice the squares that are representing the effect size estimate, and also notice the horizontal lines around the squares that represents the 95% confidence interval. Um, the size of each square represents the study's weight. And as you can see here, the Egypt 1989 study has the highest weight because the, it has the biggest um, square. Notice also that the scale of the x-axis represents the range of the effect sizes and their 95% 95 confident, 95 confidence intervals in the primary studies. Because the effect measure is a risk ratio, a risk ratio of one means no difference, like I said earlier. Notice the diamond that represents the combined effect, as you can see combined effect here. And here it is specified as a random effect. Notice the location, it, this location relative to the line of no effect and it's 95% confidence interval. So the relative risk, I mean, I can't tell for sure, but the relative, the, the risk ratio is about 4.8 and the 95% confidence interval is about, let's say 1.8 to 10.4. So this basically says that there is a positive um, risk. The risk of in developing intestinal schistosomiasis is higher when people live in irrigated areas. So that is one thing that we can take away from this um, from this forest plot. I'm going to go on and show you a few more forest plots. So here's another example and I'm going to let you, I'm going to pause for like five minutes, sorry, five seconds.
to let you look at the um, forest plot. Okay, so here's another example. It's examining the association between depression and the risk of Al Alzheimer's disease. And you can see um, the study IDs, the author and the year on the left. You can also see that the forest plot is stratified by study type. So on top, you have the case control studies. And at the bottom, you have the cohort studies. And for each category, you have the subtotal, which is like the pooled estimate. So this subtotal here is a pooled estimate for the case control studies. The subtotal here is the pooled estimate for the cohort studies. And then you, you have the overall pooled estimate at the bottom, right? And on the, on the right, you have the odds ratio for each study and then for the overall. So what do you, what do you conclude? This meta-analysis suggests that there is some positive association between depression and the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. As you can see, the diamonds, that is the pooled, the pooled estimate for each subcategory of study and the overall is on the right side of the effect of the line of no effect, the solid line that is at the odds ratio of one. So if you also look at the width of the diamond in each category, you can see that the case control study is the same, their estimate is a little more precise than the estimate for the cohort studies and the estimate for the overall studies even more precise. So basically both the point estimates for the um, pooled, the point estimates of the pooled averages and their 95% confidence intervals fall on the right side. They do not cross the line of um, no effect. So here it suggests that there is actually an association between depression and the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So I will go on and then we'll, we'll look at some more, um, we'll look at some more forest plots. Take a moment to look at this and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so in this example, the authors actually looked at studies examining the effect of two different interventions on an outcome. So here is the effect of N95 respirator or similar versus no face mask. And then the effect of surgical face mask or something similar versus no face mask on the, on the, um, risk on the, sorry on the odds of getting a particular viral um, infection. So here you see, the, and they actually pro provide even more information. You can see the authors, the study IDs. You can see the countries where those studies were conducted. You can see the virus against which um, these interventions were. Instituted, and you can see the setting in which those interventions happened. So there's a lot of information in this forest plot that actually tells you about where the studies, where the study was done, what viruses they were studying, in what setting, in what country, and then the type of interventions that were tested. And so look at the here, the solid line again is a line of no effect, and you can see it's the adjusted odds ratio of one. And an odds ratio of one just says there is no effect. And then look at the individual studies, right? The individual studies, the, the square represents the point estimate. The horizontal line around the square represents the 95% confidence interval for each of the studies. And you can see here for the first set, first category of interventions, there's a subtotal. Um, point estimate, the pooled estimate. And then for the second set of interventions, you can see 
the subtotal pool's estimate, the diamonds, and you can see the width of the diamonds represent the 95% confidence interval of this pooled estimate. Here, the authors have not just done a random effects meta-analysis, but remember we said earlier that it, and, uh, one of the ways to address the challenges around random effects meta-analysis is also a Bayesian method. So here, they've also, they've also calculated a Bayesian overall and you can see I squared here, one of the measures of heterogeneity is 88%, suggesting that there's, there's, there was a lot of variation between those studies. So basically you can see here, this, um, this study, and if you look at the x-axis, the x-axis has also been labeled as to anything towards the left favors face mask. So it says that if you wear a face mask, then your risk of um your 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 odds of acquiring these viruses is lower. And if you don't wear a face mask, that's towards the right, your odds are lower. And you can see that most of the primary studies favor wearing face masks, and the pooled um estimate for the primary studies also favor wearing a face mask. So here's another, this is a if you like a busier um forest plot, and here, at the extreme right, you can see the weight of the individual studies. So one more um, forest plot, actually a few more. Um, I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at this. Okay, great. So same um, same paper actually, and you can see this is an even busier forest plot that looks at the effect. It looks at the if it doesn't just look at the effect. It looks at it, this. These are the study IDs as usual, and then they've been stratified by the virus. So. This studies up here, we're looking at the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, MERS, and this was SARS, and then this is COVID-19. And then the countries where this happened, whether it was a respirator that they were testing or not. So this, so for instance, this one zero means no. So in this paper by Van Kove, they were did no wear respirator and were testing you know, like a distance of no distance at all. There were events, um, they were looking at acquiring MERS based on the um, distance between people and all of that. And so you can see basically, I'm not, I, I, I don't remember the details of this paper, so I won't tell you all the details about it, but you can see basically the study IDs and lots and lots of details about the studies. You can see the solid line of no effect. You can see the x-axis label that to the to the left, anything that goes to the left of the um, line of no effect favors further distance. So maybe social distancing and acquiring these viruses or transmitting these viruses, while anything to the right favors shorter distance. You can see the boxes, you can see the squares. The squares represent each point estimate. The size of the squares, remember, represent the weight. The horizontal lines around the squares represent the 95% confidence interval. And so for MERS, for instance, you can see they actually did get the pooled estimate for each virus. They got an unadjusted overall estimate and an adjusted overall estimate. And so you can see basically that. So this this um, forest plus is just showing you again that you can stratify the primary studies by different categories that make sense, maybe based on what you're finding in the literature, based on your hypothesis, or based on your um, subject matter expertise in that area. So we will go on to another. Um, We'll go on to another um, forest plot. 
And this is a cleaner one with fewer um, with fewer primary studies. And you can see here again, the study IDs, the name of the author and the year. You can see the solid line of no effect. And you can see here that we, our effect estimate is the risk ratio. So because of that, the line of no effect is at one. Um, this is comparing I vol length of stay after esophagectomy at high volume hospitals and low volume hospitals. And to the left of the um, of the line of no effect, it favors high volume hospitals, and then to the right favors the low volume hospitals. You can see the the squares that represent the point estimate from each study, and the horizontal lines around them that represent the 95% confidence interval. And you can see here, the, the longer the confidence, the longer the horizontal line, the less precise those, um, those studies are. And so the smaller the weight that they are assigned. And you can see here, this Al Sarira paper, 2007, it has the biggest square. And so it has the highest weight in this study. You can see Yasunaga 2009, it has the smallest square. It has the longest horizontal line around it, suggesting it's like five percent confidence interval. Actually, Vagues has the longest around it. So suggesting that 95% confidence interval is very wide and it has the smallest weight. So this weight, they are from random effects meta-analysis. And you can see here, this is the overall, the pooled estimate. Estimate, it's on the left side of the line of no effect, suggesting that um, the risk of prolonged the prolonged stay after esophagectomy is higher at the high volume sites, and um, you can see it's ninety five percent confidence interval by going by looking at the wings or the tips or the width of the diamond. So basically, this is how you would look at the forest plots that you read or this, how you would interpret the forest plots that you produce. Um, we have now come to the end of this session and I'm going to take you know, 30 seconds to say, think about it, what are your key takeaways from, this, for, from today's class? So, um, what I would say is that data synthesis is, is one of the steps in getting our meta-analysis done, but it is not, the, we should not jump straight to that step. You should take time to, you know, go through your protocol, extract all the data that's necessary. Sometimes you don't get all the data that you need in, from the primary studies the way you want them, and there are ways around that. And your overall, your pooled effect, your, your pooled estimate is ultimately a weighted average and how you assign the weights, you have to think about how you assign the weights very carefully and you don't just, you know, like choose something because that's what you've seen in literature. You have to, it's based on what you want to do with the uh, meta-analysis and more importantly, your understanding of the way of the characteristics of the primary studies, the way the exposures and the outcomes were measured, whether it is reasonable to believe that those um, outcomes or those, those studies were conducted in the same population with the same, um, the outcomes measured in the same way and all of that. And um, when you're done, when you've made a decision about whether you're doing a fixed effect or random effects um, analysis, you present your data with um, a forest plot. And the forest plot really just gives you a visual of everything that's gone on in your data analysis. Don't forget the line of no, the solid line of no effect and whether your diamond, that is the pooled estimate, whether it, whether it falls on the left or on the right. Also remember that the width or the, the area of the square represents the weight of the individual study. So studies that have higher weights would have the bigger squares and that has something to do also with the reliability or the standard errors of the primary studies. Thank you very much for attending this class. See you in the next class.